while plying the waters near East Washerwoman Light Tower 49. Here's two more wrecks to check out. About one and a half miles nearly due south from Washerwoman rests the barge, a metal vessel about 45 by 100 feet, roughly 8 feet tall and 20 feet of water. She sank in the mid-1960s. When the blue water is in, the barge is a world-class dive site that doesn't take a back seat to any shallow water wreck dive in the Caribbean. About two-thirds of a mile, 160 degrees south-southeast from the barge, the reef begins to drop off. On this sloping shelf is all that remains of the four kids shrimp boat in 60 feet of water. She swamped while underway in the late 1970s. Constructed mostly of wood, all that remains now are her scattered metal components. For more great dive sites in the Marathon area, check out Volumes 9, 10, and 11 of Key's Dive Guide, exclusively on YouTube. Welcome to Volume 29 of Key's Dive Guide, Marathon's Mystery Galleon. In the last episode of Key's Dive Guide, we looked at a line of patch reefs running to the northeast from East Washerwoman Shoal. These reefs have rung the death knell for dozens of ships through the centuries. Today we're going to explore a military vessel that fell victim to this reef line in the mid-1600s, Marathon's Mystery Dive. This diagram of the wreck site, created by the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research in 2005, illustrates the many areas that we're going to visit on this ancient vessel. We're heading about seven miles almost due west from Coffin's Patch to the Mystery Dive. Passing over her now. Situated on a trail of patch reefs stretching to the northeast from East Washerwoman Shoal, the Mystery Galleon rests in 18 feet of water with the top of her ballast mound only 8 feet from the surface. She's about 2 miles from the shores of Marathon. If you'd like to find her the hard way, line up East Sister Rock so that it just overlaps Boot Key at 275 degrees 
west northwest. Here is my hand drawn range from over the wreck. Notice the house and trees on East Sister Rock. Then line up the red and white micro tower at 300 degrees west northwest. Here's another hand drawn range. Notice the tree, a large Norfolk pine just to the left of the micro tower. Also notice the Marathon High School athletic field lights. The three lights to the right of the tower are spaced closer together than the three lights to the left of the tower. When you've nailed the first two ranges, marker 48 will be about 070 degrees to the east-northeast from the wreck. Let's study this clustered formation of patch reefs. The first three reefs of this chain only cover about three quarters of a mile on the NOAA chart. However, the satellite view shows a massive patch reef extending to the northeast for several additional miles. Moving down closer to the Mystery Galleon, her keel scars are plainly visible even after nearly 400 years. This was a solid ship of relatively new construction to inflict this much damage on the reef. She exploded into these shallows on a northerly track with tremendous force. After blasting through the coral for nearly 70 feet, she was jolted to the northwest before arcing to her starboard, plowing into her final grave site, bow facing north-northeast, helplessly wedged into the coral. The ghostly shadow of this once proud vessel is clearly visible on the reef, nearly four centuries after her grounding. The Mystery Galleon was about 70 feet long and 22 feet wide at the beam, displacing less than 200 tons. She was either an Aviso, a ship that carried messages between the fleet, or possibly a Guerra, a speedy lookout battleship to warn the larger galleons of approaching danger. Either Portuguese, Spanish, or Dutch ship, hmm. which is over 300 years over here. This vessel definitely was built in the early 1600s and must have sunk somewhere past 1640. And today, the professional salvage, they know when you find the bronze or copper pin in this area in the shipwreck, you start dealing with something which is done past 1700, not before that. In the early 1970s, the Mystery Galleon was thought to be number 19, San Ignacio, a lost ghost ship of the 1733 fleet, shown here on the old shipwreck chart. However, the San Ignacio is listed as Submergido Ignacio, or submerged Ignacia. The Mystery Galleon stayed intact after she grounded. She was well above the waterline, not submerged. Also, one look at her granite rock ballast provides a sharp contrast to the round Portuguese river rock found on all of the 1733 wreck sites. There is no evidence in this ballast pile whatsoever this ballast bar has anything to do with the 1733 fleet. There is rumored to be another ancient wreck completely covered by sand on the south side of this formation. Looking at reef number three in this area, less than a half mile northeast from the Mystery Galleon, a visible sand line heading roughly 280 degrees west-northwest Nearly the same track as the Coffin's Patch wreck trail of the 1733 fleet is plainly visible. Could this be a keel scar from the long lost San Ignacio of the 1733 fleet? Several dark anomalies pepper the reef at the end of the sand line. I'm convinced that this trail of patch reefs hides the secrets of several ghost ships currently concealed by the sands and coral of time. As one of South Florida's oldest artificial reefs, 
the mystery galleon has become an integral part of a vibrant marine ecosystem, lush with corals and friendly fish. Therefore, obviously, this is a fantastic pleasure dive site. You can bring a thousand people here from north and they will... I just wanted to find one little thing from the Spanish wreck. The subconscious is saying, yeah, maybe I'm going to find one of those gold bars. But we are, that's human. That's okay. Right. All right? There's nothing wrong with it, okay? People will destroy the entire ballast pile for one single coin. Now, commercial Salvo will not do that because it costs him tremendous amount of money to go work out. And it takes time for the entire season. Past 30, 40 years, they dynamite. That's fact. But everybody was doing mi mistakes. The fact is, last 25 years and in this family, I know people will not do that anymore. Dynamite reefs, whatever. Because we have a different technology to excavate the treasure where it's fine and it tap the wreck. It's almost due north. The stern is on the south side. The whole ship is still to the east, about two and a half to four degree. <clears throat> Here in the front, it's all heavy and a coral encrusted. It is a beauty. It's a one best looking ballast pile in my 25 years diving here. Underneath the stern is a recess that allows divers access beneath the wreck for a great view of her structural timbers. Where you can slowly, very carefully, slide yourself in under the ballast pile, which doesn't I don't believe it exists anywhere in the world. You can see the ribs, you can see the top, upper, upper deck, bilge deck, over your head. When you slide yourself in, give yourself a couple seconds when you can see it, and your left side, you're gonna see, looks like concrete wall. When you chip that little bit, about three-eighths of an inch crustacean, there's a wood kill. Heading up the starboard side of the wreck, a lone ceiling plank seems wedged beneath the ballast. Further up her starboard, there appear to be wooden support timbers of her inner hull construction. Even though these timbers look like wood, when the Florida Bureau of Underwater Archaeology investigated this site in 2005, they discovered these timbers were actually composed of granite a concrete-like substance that was poured between the lower hull frames for protection against rough edge ballast stones and shifting cargo. What is visible here is actually a negative image of the timbers that rotted away in the salt water over time. We're ascending the ballast mound to see a hole dug by the original salvers of this wreck in 1972, including Tom Gurr, and Ray Manieri. The bow components of this ship are definitely worth exploring.
most of her structural timbers were composed of white oak with Aleppo pine from the Mediterranean used for her hull planking. Heading under the bow from the starboard side, another angle of the bow assembly is visible along with a porcupine puffer fish that doesn't seem too thrilled with my arrival. Although no gold or silver has ever been found on this site, the real treasure is the superb, intact condition of this ancient sailing vessel. Traveling over the bow, we're heading to her extensive munitions magazine on the port side, just forward of midship. Hundreds of cannonballs ranging from nine to 18 pounds, thousands of three quarter inch round shot, grape shot, and a large vein of gunpowder indicate a military vessel. In the northwest corner of this beautiful ballast pile, I find, I don't know, 200 cannonballs, five and a half inch, 18 pounders, big cannon, big cannon, very heavy cannon. And some of those cannonballs has letter A. By my knowledge, it's Dutch. Well, if somebody couldn't sell Spanish cannonball, okay? Dutch cannonball to the Spanish, all right? Here's a close-up of the excavated munitions magazine with three-quarter inch round shot and the seam of gunpowder clearly visible. Ordinarily, visibility is poor here on these patch reefs, but today we have over 30 feet of visibility. Another structural oddity of this wreck is the huge crack near the stern that runs from port to starboard. This indicates her keel was broken as she crashed to a halt nearly 400 years ago. Fire bricks from the ship's galley pepper the top of the ballast mound. A rather large but friendly green moray eel lives in a recess on the port side of the wreck. I hope you enjoyed the show. Join us next time as we explore over 50 dive sites of the Upper Keys. For Florida Keys Dive Odyssey, this is Don Ferguson.
I want to thank my technical advisor, Stefan Sakura. Stefan is a brilliant navigator, a renowned treasure salver, and as a shipwreck historian, he's a true genius. Stefan transforms himself into the minds of ancient mariners to unlock secrets of the past. Yeah, let's go.